Good morning, everybody, or good whatever time it is when you are opening up this lecture, and welcome to week 12 of History 212 in Early American History. Today, what we're going to be discussing is westward expansion and the idea of manifest destiny and how that ties in with the system of slavery and the key question of what are the borders of slavery going to be or if it's going to have any borders at all. So what we're going to do in this lecture is begin with an examination of the idea of manifest destiny and kind of expand beyond that to then look at expansion within the context of the development of the cotton economy and how that relates to the evolution of slavery uh, in the uh, increasingly mid-1800s and the emergence of major abolitionist forces, uh, major uh, groups that were opposed to slavery. So before we continue with the lecture, just as a reminder that you'll want to go on to the discussion board at least three times this week to discuss the readings and this lecture. Uh, I was asked uh, via email this uh, past week as to whether or not the material that gets uh, discussed here in these lectures is appropriate to bring up on those discussion boards. It very much is. Uh, as much as you can integrate whatever this lecture material is with the readings to see the connections between all of these things, uh, that's the best way to go. The other tip that I would have is keep your eye on the revised schedule. Uh, so April 17th is the due date for the next paper. That is, that'll be something that you'll want to keep an eye on. Also keep in mind as well that next week we'll be given over to a discussion of Frederick Douglass and the narrative uh, of the life of a slave. And so the discussion board will be even more important that week because this will be such a major source. So with that class business out of the way, let's get moving forward. Manifest destiny is the idea that it is the United States' destiny as granted by a higher power to expand beyond the Mississippi River all the way to the Pacific Ocean, that the United States should be a power that stretches from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Now, there are some core assumptions that underlie the idea of this destiny. The first is that American values, the United States values and institutions, are superior to others, not just on the continent, but around the globe, and that justifies the expansion into new territory. The second assumption is that the lands west of the Mississippi are naturally destined for U.S. dominance because there's no real organized state that would stand in the way. There are Native American tribes, some of this territory will belong to Mexico, Canada still has British control, but none really are vying for this, you know, the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and the United States sees itself as the natural occupier of these lands based on its growing population. Finally, and kind of interrelated with those previous two, is the idea that God and the Constitution kind of together create the destiny for American control. This is a kind of Americanization of religion. And so this manifest destiny is expressed in this image on the screen pretty well, I think, which is why I selected it. Uh, this is the image of kind of Columbia, which is a representation of, of North American, you know, progress, an angelic figure who's walking across the continent and bringing the light of civilization with her. And we can see some particularly noteworthy things in this image. For example, she's carrying in her hand telegraph wire, and then behind that comes trains. And we see the evolution of technology from trains to stagecoaches to covered wagons uh, to the kind of darker areas, that this is representing a core belief in U.S. supremacy and the signs of technological supremacy reflect a civilizational supremacy. And so Manifest Destiny is calling on the United States to fulfill its, you know, the phrasing itself kind of gives it away. The Manifest Destiny is the obvious destiny of the United States to keep expanding. Now, there's 
reasons beyond just this kind of American religion of expansion that the United States pushes west. So politically speaking, there is a you know, way that you can use westward expansion to get around difficult issues regarding slavery and sectional difference between the North and South that we saw last week. If you can all agree that westward expansion is a good thing, then you can unite your political efforts behind that. Uh, the Democratic Party, which has been kind of the you know, superior party at this point, embraces a movement called Young America, which this kind of young American is going to be the exceptional citizen and pushing West as part of that, that youth because it's such a sign of, you know, your vitality that you're willing to go out into the wilderness to challenge yourself. Now, beyond the political goal of migration, there's a lot of messages that are going out to people about the opportunity that's out there. So Horace Greeley, a newspaperman in New York, calls on you know, the kind of young Americans not to lounge in the cities. Uh, there is room and health in the country away from the crowds of idlers and imbeciles. Go west before you are fitted for no life but that of the factory. Uh, so we can see also here a kind of suspicion and dislike of industrial work that's changing. So going west is an alternative to working in this newly industrializing economy. We can see one of the readings for this week in Catherine Hahn, some of the realities of expanding West, you know, kind of what drove Catherine Hahn out there and what her actual experience was. You know, many people immigrated to the United States from Europe in this period and then would move West. Um, you know, some in the, you know, moving West also still meant being North into Minnesota, for example. Uh, many Norwegians, Scandinavians went into that area, which, you know, still today reflects those influences. The Western migration is something that kind of captures a lot of different parts of American society. Even the party that arises in opposition to the Democratic Party, the Whig Party, uh, is generally pro-expansion and argues for the use of internal improvements, you know, internal infrastructure to promote expansion rather than just, you know, only focus on what you currently have in the uh, concentrated United States on the eastern seaboard and then the territory past the Appalachians, uh, but east of the Mississippi River. There are, though, anti-expansionists who see, one, potential conflict within the country as a result of expansion, because it's only putting off some of these hard political questions. And as the country expands, it also brings up this question of how is slavery going to expand with it? Now, all of these kinds of factors, the concern over slavery, the desire to push westward, some of the suspicion of pushing westward, um, the assumption of U.S. virtue, will help lead to war with Mexico. Now, Mexico at this point is much bigger than it is today, and it's much bigger than it is today because a lot of territory that is Mexican territory uh, is going to become United States territory. So Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, kind of reaching uh, in parts all the way up to Idaho, um, this is all part of Mexico at the time. And the conflict between the United States and Mexico starts with Texas as during the 1820s, after Mexico had become independent from Spain, uh, they tried to create a buffer between Mexico and the United States by inviting immigrants into Texas. Now, this ultimately ended up being a poor idea because those people who came to Texas still tended to have, you know, more of an identification with the United States than with Mexico. And this intensified when the Mexican government banned slavery in Texas and also insisted that anybody who was there converted to Catholicism, which the uh, white Texans ignored. This led to a conflict between the Mexican government and the Texans who had settled there. Texas ultimately becomes independent, and there's a period where Texas is essentially an independent republic. But even then, there are those in Texas who consider their destiny to be part of the United States. And one of the people who wants to see that happen is James K. Polk. Uh, 
a politician who came you know, essentially out of nowhere, but whose political career was based on adopting Texas into the U.S. and to then create a larger expansion of the U.S. into westward territory. So Texas becomes the 28th state after being admitted to the Union in 1845, and then hostilities develop between Mexico and the United States over the border between Texas and Mexico. Um, Polk claims that U.S. forces were attacked in their territory by Mexicans, uh, though there's you know some dispute as to where the conflict actually happened because both the uh, both sides thought that their territory extended further into the others than they believed. Now, at this time, a young congressman named Abraham Lincoln was deeply suspicious of war with Mexico because he saw it as part of a plot to expand the kind of reach of the Southern slavery empire. And Lincoln got the derogatory nickname of Spotty Lincoln because he demanded to know on what spot of the map was American blood shed by Mexicans. However, while there are those who oppose war with Mexico, ultimately the pro-war forces win the day, and the United States enters into a, a, a conflict with Mexico. The 12th president of the United States, Zachary Taylor, fought a campaign in Texas against the Mexican army, while Winfield Scott, uh, a veteran of the War of 1812, took an expeditionary force uh, over the uh, through the Gulf of Mexico onto the Mexican coast, uh, and then marched to Mexico City, taking control of the capital. Many of the junior officers who took part in this war together would later serve in the American Civil War on both sides of the conflict. This is where many of the you know leading combat uh, figures in the American Civil War get their first experience. Most of the casualties come from disease rather than from combat, uh, and taking Mexico City didn't necessarily end the war because the Mexican government had managed to flee. Uh, but ultimately, the U.S. is able to force Mexico to surrender. So the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that ends the Mexican-American War sees Mexico giving a lot of its territory over to the United States. So the border with Texas is officially recognized in Texas's favor, and thus the United States' favor, and the Mexican cession listed there on the map, which consists of, you know, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, California, you know, this is a vast amount of territory. And this territory essentially completes Manifest Destiny. You know, the U.S. now has control of territory from the Atlantic to the Pacific. There are still some in the South who want to just conquer Mexico outright, uh, but there's plenty of reasons not to do that. For one, a lot of the territory in Mexico is not prime territory for growing cotton, which is the main concern of the Southerners at this point. Uh, two, the Northerners don't really go along with that. And three, the people of Mexico are increasingly seen as of a uh, different character, uh, a different racial character than the United States. And so one of the reasons that the U.S. doesn't continue the war is fear of bringing in increasing diversity to the United States. Um, so we're essentially finished with expansion here, which means that a lot of the questions that expansion and the effort behind expansion, uh, you know, put off, well, now they're coming back. And the question is, how will slavery expand into this new territory? Because if it does keep expanding, then the whole idea of essentially ending it by preventing it from growing, well, that's pretty much dead and gone. We're still in the era at this point of the Missouri Compromise, and so there's a lot of territory south of that compromise line. And so the political fights start pretty early and often. This leads to the Compromise of 1850. This is the last major act of Henry Clay, who we saw last week, who tries to address everybody's concerns, making no one happy, as technically often happens with compromise. But basically, it reaffirms the Missouri Compromise so that slavery could expand more into this uh, territory. And most controversially, it strengthens the Fugitive Slave Act. 
Now, this is something that had existed before. There's provision for it within the Constitution, but it basically says that if an enslaved person escapes into a free state, that free state has to cooperate in sending them back. That you know, slave owners have the right to go into the North uh, to uh, recapture escaped people who are you know fleeing from slavery. Now, in the past, this had been an issue of some controversy, but didn't really develop the level of intense hatred that it would inspire in the 1850s, because increasingly this is a question not of everybody can agree that slavery is bad and we just don't know how to get rid of it. This is now a question of how do we define our civilization and how do we reconcile what we believe and what we say we believe with the existence of slavery. The debates between the Southerners and the Northerners become increasingly adversarial. And there's also a kind of development of a specific kind of slavery culture that is different from what has come before. That increasingly, slavery is seen in the South by Southern politicians, by Southern whites, not just as a necessity, but as a positive good. Now, back in the before quarantine times, this is something that I had talked about keeping your eyes on. Uh, for a transition that's really important for us to understand. And so here now is the kind of, you know, real clear turnaround point in that transition. It had been happening for a while leading up to this, but by the 1850s, it's too obvious to deny that in the Declaration of Independence era, in the constitutional debates, you know, in the Missouri Compromise even, the general assumption is that we want to see the end of slavery eventually, we just have to figure out the way to do that without disruption. And again, it's easy for the people making these decisions uh, to say, you know, it'll end someday because they're not actually enslaved themselves. But you could see in John Adams' recollection of his discussions with Calhoun that, you know, Calhoun, even at that point in 1820, is saying that, well, they want to end slavery eventually. But Adams identifies in Calhoun a kind of, you know, sense of superiority from having slavery. And by 1850, Southerners are no longer arguing that they will eventually kind of figure out how to end slavery. Instead, they say that slavery is a moral good, that slavery allows for the fullest development of citizenship for those who own slaves, and that the promises of the Declaration of Independence were never meant to apply to people of African descent uh, because they are fundamentally racially different. And the argument goes that slavery is the best thing for those of African descent because of their racial difference. So this has been the evolution of the argument, the pro-slavery argument, that makes it now, not just this perceived economic necessity, but kind of core to the Southern cultural identity, that they, as Southern gentlemen, as, you know, Southern owners, are superior because of their ability to own slaves uh, and to, you know, oversee this system. And that's a change that's going to make it very hard to figure out any kind of compromise. Now, this change has coexisted with the change of economic conditions, which is the development of cotton and the cotton economy. So this is what ties the United States increasingly into global trade, uh, and it is the source of profound wealth uh, for the South. So in 1820, a specific breed of cotton, the Petite Gulf cotton, uh, is you know introduced to the United States and increasingly used from the cotton gin, it's easier to work through the cotton gin. And so there's a profound expansion of cotton uh, cultivation. So we can see just the change of 35 years going from 6.5 million pounds of cotton sent to northern and international markets to 500 million pounds of cotton coming from the five largest cotton growing states. This is 55% of the U.S. global import trade. Uh, so this is a lot of 
cotton that's flowing and it brings a lot of money. And it leads to this kind of boom cycle of plantation development. Now, boom and bust as well. It's you know fairly unstable, but it's a source of great potential profit. And as you know, that profit kind of can be seen by everybody, it vastly increases the number of, you know, kind of plantations and the number of enslaved to work them. The cotton gin, uh, you know, as an, an, an engine that's supposed to make cotton cultivation easier, it did not have the effect of reducing the labor force because it meant saying, well, we'll have a reduced labor force if we want to produce the same amount of cotton we were producing before. But now they want to produce a lot more of it. And so you can produce even more with the cotton gin, but you need this expanded labor force. Now, I mentioned there's this boom and bust, and the people who most suffered during that were, of course, those enslaved, because they were seen as assets. So if you got into financial difficulty, one of the things you could do was sell your assets, which meant selling human beings, which meant separating out families, which meant, you know, profound dislocation. And all of this kind of tied to the development of a huge economic uh, kind of uh, tornado that hits the United States, uh, in which all of these southern growers see the real money coming in with cotton. In. Uh, so this is the era so-called of King Cotton. Now, King Cotton suggests not just the you know strength of plantation growers in the so-called cotton belt uh, that kind of stretches across the purple area of that map there, but it's intimately connected with the overall economic development of the country because the cotton is grown in these er uh, areas on the map here, but it's shipped over rail lines throughout the north to uh, you know garment factories to industry in the north it's the raw material that feeds into the industrial machine um, and then it also goes to Philadelphia New York City Baltimore Boston all of the harbors and is shipped out across the world uh, especially to Great Britain and France and to their own textile factories there so cotton changes the economy and it makes slavery more valuable than it had been before. You know, slavery becomes, for the South, even more of a pillar of their economy. And so that is where we see this kind of uh, growth of the pro-slavery arguments. The idea of slavery culturally as a good thing goes concurrently with slavery as even more of an economic bedrock of the southern economy and the larger U.S. economy. Now, this wealth will end up in a lot of different places. Uh, this is you know, not just in the Cotton Belt, but in New York trading houses, in shipping firms, in colleges that get endowments from uh, wealthy Southerners. That's why, for example, at, uh, I think it was Yale, you have Calhoun Hall, uh, named after John Calhoun of South Carolina, who had uh, been a graduate there. Co uh, the King Cotton development really makes slavery more entrenched than anybody had kind of feared to think about. The Cotton Belt is the same thing as the Black Belt, uh, another term that's applied to it. And the trend that we can see is increasing population shifting from enslaved people to the deeper south, where there are these cotton plantations. So the upper south, you know, North Carolina, Virginia, there is still, you know, slavery there. But in the deep south, this is where we get to the point of, you know, states that have half their population, 60% of their population, as being enslaved. And it also leads to the desire for greater slavery. Now, you can't import slaves at this point uh, because Congress had banned that uh, back in 1807. But the way that you get more slaves is people having kids. And so you have more and more children born into slavery and staying in slavery. You know, you have fewer manumissions, which means, you know, freeing an enslaved population. And so the spike in the total number of 
slaves in the United States is coming as cotton cultivation is spiking. Now we can see especially in that turnover point between 1840 and 1860 on the graph there. So if you were an enslaved person, going to the Deep South was a particular fearful threat uh, because the conditions there are worse. The cotton fields are much, you know, uh, a, a much harsher work environment than in other parts of the United States. This was one of the things that came up recently with Georgetown, uh, which had a, you know, group of enslaved people that were, you know, owned by Georgetown University. And in order to settle debts, they were sold into the Deep South. Now, Georgetown has recently issued, you know, and by recently, I mean, in the last few years, uh, you know, a plan for uh, reparations around this. But it, it's representative of a larger shift. Now, this shift to the South also has real complications, as you might imagine, for the families. Because if you have enslaved families, and if that's what's accounting for the number of newly enslaved people, well, the selling them off, you don't tend to sell them as families. And so families get separated. You know, husbands, wives, you know, parents and children, siblings, all scattered across the United States as a result of being sold to these different cotton-growing areas. Now, along with the separation is the increase in violence, and economics are tied to the violence. Uh, because the cotton cycle is always demanding more and more production. This is kind of basic economics. The more and more you produce of something, the less valuable it will be on the market. You drive down its price. This is just supply and demand. So if you're the individual plantation owner, it's in your interest to keep producing more and more cotton to stay profitable. And in order to do that, you drive more and more production. Now, ultimately, of course, this just drives the price down further. But what this means for the enslaved workers is that they are treated even more harshly to drive this economic cycle forward. And on top of that is the fact that in a population center where there's you know, maybe 50% of the population is enslaved, the white population is always afraid of uprisings and will use brutal violence to send a message of you know, total rejection. Never think about any kind of resistance. Never think about any kind of you know, change in your status. So this violent system uh, you know, that is about you know, keeping down the enslaved people to work on the cotton plantations, it also has a social construct, a social element to it. I'd mentioned the sense of Southern culture as being tied to slavery. We also have the sense of Southern honor that comes from this. That, that, that honor is something that you can kind of tell based on your status as being free or slave, and that the Southern gentleman had to defend this institution to defend the ideas of, of honor. Uh, and to be deeply suspicious of anybody who argued against slavery, of anybody who was an abolitionist. So an abolitionist is someone who doesn't just oppose slavery, but who wants it ended immediately, who doesn't want a plan for its gradual end, but who essentially argues that slavery is such a fundamental moral wrong that it has to be finished. Now, William Lloyd Garrison, one of the most prominent abolitionists, starts a newspaper called The Liberator, in which he ends the first issue by saying, I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? I will be as hard as truth and as uncompromising as justice. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch, and I will be heard. Garrison insists on calling slavery for what it is, a moral abomination. And he is even going so far as to call the Constitution of the United States a compact with the devil, because the Constitution has created a situation in which they're compromising over slavery and not trying to eliminate it wholesale. Uh, abolitionists joined together in the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1833 and encounter 
increasingly violent resistance and more extreme arguments for the South. In border states like Missouri and Kentucky, abolitionists are met with violence. An abolitionist preacher is murdered by a mob. Uh, there's always threats against abolitionist uh, agitation. And the southern states actually start passing laws saying that, you know, it is against the law to advocate for the end of slavery. And we see increasingly, uh, you know, kind of extreme arguments, such as those uh, in one of the readings for this week from Manley about the southern perspective of all of this. But the abolitionists insist on putting this whole debate on its real moral terms, saying, you know, slavery is just an unacceptable uh, moral atrocity, and that the United States has to either end it, it has to be willing to risk disunion in order to bring about the end of this practice. And we'll see in discussing Frederick Douglass, you know, his perspective on it as an African American, as a former slave, and as an abolitionist. And we'll also see how this increasingly you know, diametric opposition between those opposed to slavery and those, you know, who can't see it as anything else now as but a part of their society, how these two forces will kind of continue to define politics, especially after that previously mentioned compromise in 1850 that doesn't settle anything, and that throughout the 1850s we see an increasingly uh, combative American political climate. So that will be it for this week. I'll talk to you all uh, next week. And just remember to be sure to post uh, three discussion board posts by Friday at 9 a.m. And I'll talk to you all soon.